Can you pass? I can s- I can do it. Yeah, just try. Wait, 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 no, I wanted I wanted to do this. Well, just again, please. Good morning. morning just uh, want to ask you microphone working okay or not you hear my voice Sean, great. Okay. Who's this? Mm-hmm. Everything okay? Yeah. yeah. Just checking. Well, hello everyone. Today I was woefully unprepared for this, but I thought anyway I should uh, hold our little gathering, even if it will be only for a short time. And uh, without much substance to say, perhaps. Um, Of course, I suffered and my family suffered a private loss. And this is something that we all face at some point. We all must face. And uh, it creates a sadness which probably never goes away, but becomes buried inside of us so that we can get on with our lives. And of course, our loved ones who have passed wish that for us, that we must continue course I will continue myself. First I want to mention that my mother was very elderly so she had lived out a full life but even so the passing of one's mother one's loved ones is is very difficult and I think that whether one is old, one is young, one is middle-aged, it's the tragedy in death is always uh, very significant, it's, it's powerful, and affects us. And we should be always sympathetic to everyone because of that. And I just want to say a few words about what I mentioned as a kind of public sadness. Uh, And I'm not speaking loud enough, I think. Yeah, okay, well, yeah. I'll come a little bit closer, perhaps, yes. Uh, And that has to do with, in a way, we can see right now the situation which we are in is the situation of the pandemic, which seems to be, uh, be abating and then is rising in places. So it seems that in a certain way, everything has stopped. And by, by that, I simply mean that, in fact, things are continuing on almost as if we have a new normal. The new normal is over one million uh, cases registered every week, over 1,000 deaths, around 1,000 deaths in 
United States alone every week. Uh, and we all, there's sadness and there's also uh, a kind of inside rage which we must have because it didn't have to be this way. And, but we find ourselves in this situation for, I think, two reasons. One, and the first reason, is cowardice. Cowardice from people who have responsibility in the world not to be cowards, but to actually... Uh, I wouldn't say, or I should say, actually protect the world, regardless of where they are. But somehow the first, the knee-jerk reaction of people when something begins is to hide it, rather than to actually explain and try to do something about this. We see this in so many different uh, levels. And especially we see this in, in what will probably be a bigger, bigger, bigger uh, issue than a pandemic now, which of course will abate at some point, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, and that is climate change. And... With that, I want to turn quickly to the problem of words. Now, climate change used to be called global warming. And the problem that happened with global warming, these words, was that people would point and say, well, today is cold. So what do you mean, global warming? And we have an explanation that climate is not weather, etc., 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 but that didn't matter. Because the words had particular usefulness for people. And they could be bent this way and that way. So from global warming, we now have climate change, which is more general in a way, and um, perhaps more sophisticated than global warming. But of course the fact is that we do have global warming. And this last year was the warmest on record. Uh, September was the warmest on record throughout the world, which doesn't mean that in a particular place it was not cold. Uh, okay. Uh, so together with this, though, I, there's a lot, lot to, I have many ideas, but I haven't really, I know, I know, I have to go this way. Yeah, uh, bear with me. Um, how to how to put them together? I have didn't really decide particularly, but uh, with that aside from uh, one second, blah 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 blah. Where did I just do that? Uh, <coughs> the news in the United States, and of course with. Uh, I'm in New York, we're that, uh, here, and we're looking at the United States, of course, uh, and with the election coming up and so many things uh, hinging on this, uh, the result of the election, of, of course, my attention, and I think much of the world's attention, is focused on the United States, and uh, we had instead of a debate yesterday, we had uh, uh, two town meetings and uh, uh, they were 
were exactly as different as we expected them to be. Uh, I'm not going to discuss them at all, so I think that's totally uninteresting. But we also... I want to get myself a little bit in order. There we go. Uh, have the, been witnessing the hearings around the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. This is uh, something that I think is very, very, very problematic. I'm not going to explain this uh, particularly to everyone. It's, uh, this is uh, many people who explain this much better than I can. But I want to talk about a little bit about words. And because uh, Amy Coney Barrett is, uh, well, she's a follower of the Justice Scalia, and uh, who is supposed to be a brilliant man, but I never felt that way. I thought he was just a bully. And bullies tend to uh, make their points sometimes in a brilliant way. But that's another thing. And what I want to talk about is the concept of originalism or original intent. And this is when you take a text and what you do, you say, what you must see is the way this text was interpreted by the writers of this text. Or the meanings of the words have to be the meanings which they had originally. Now, there's something that uh, incredibly uh, naive, not naive, but insidious about this. You see, I could say this uh, originalism this is that the concept views the Constitution is stable from the time of enactment and its meanings can only be changed by steps set out of Article 5. This has to do with amendments. Uh, This notion stands in contrast to the concept of the living Constitution, which asserts that the Constitution should be interpreted based on the context of current times, even if such interpretation is different from the original interpretation of the document. Now, the problem with this is the fact that when you look at anything, there is an essential misinterpretation that there, I look at something, someone else looks at, at something, and we may come to some kind of an agreement about it, but most likely we have di our own different perspectives. And the meaning of words, just like global warming, uh, can be and are always interpreted in various ways depending on people's desires and motives. So this original intent, and I, I, I'm not distinguishing between original intent, original originalism, and all of this kind of uh, stuff. That, but let's say original intent. That I like that very much because we know what was the original intent of the founding fathers of uh, the United States for instance, who wrote the Constitution. We go back in the word and this word means this, this word, and we, we point to something definite. Now, uh, of course, going back all the way before Plato, we understand 
that we do not have exact one-to-one -one correspondence between words and things, and what are things, etc. Right? And uh, we come up and we go to the great philosopher of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and we see how words and language evolves through practice and through a kind of community of being. Now, uh, okay, so what do I want to say about this? That this original intent, right, actually masks simply the prejudices of the people who are supposedly interpreting the original interpretation. But, of course, because there's original intent, okay, they can hide behind this you know, so that their prejudices, their ulterior motives also, uh, let's say someone like, like the Supreme Court Justice Powell, uh, who steered the, the court in a way which is much more business-friendly, but he, he was able to hide behind the letter of the law, let's say, and in that way steer the country to a, a position which I, I, and I think most people in the country actually, believe is not right. Going back to to the present nominee, this is uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, who uh, again espouses from Scalia, Powell, etc., this uh, idea notion of original intent that you, you look at the document, and, uh, and I think the the uh, hubris of someone who can say that. I know what the original was is is actually remarkable. Uh, we we can see that when we look in our little world at uh, let's say historical practice, performance practice, which. Uh, and I, I guess I will continue a bit these points, right? And I will be, will be talking about this. I did earlier, and but I will be talking about this in, in more detail, about the, the fallacy of historical performance practice, in a way, that, see, that this is how things were. Uh, so even from, from our little field, we understand that when you're looking back, you can pretend to know, but you cannot know, actually, what it is. Okay, uh, now there's one other thing which has to do with, and this was, I, I was uh, especially struck by one of her answers to questions, which basically she evaded. But this had to do with climate change, and her answer said that, well, I'm not a scientist. Now I found that very interesting because is she a historian? No. Is a linguist? Maybe not. Now, does that mean that when someone, or she is, or someone else, let's say, who is not an expert in the field, is called upon to make a judgment, they're not an expert, so if she says, I'm not an expert in, in I'm not a scientist, uh, she didn't say she wasn't an expert in climate, she just said, she, I'm not a scientist. Uh, 
does that mean that that person should recuse herself or himself from the actual judgment because that person does not have the information? I don't believe that she believes that, for instance, or that other members of the Supreme Court or other courts actually believe that. Okay. Uh, I finish with all of this now, and I just want to offer one more thing. And earlier in the pandemic, I, I wrote a little clarinet duet. And, and I thought, well, when should I, when should, should I play it for the live stream? Should I not? And I think perhaps now is actually the time to play it. This is the response to everything which was happening and to all of the misfortune and tragedy that was happening, especially the, in the early stages. I have to say before this that what you've seen so far is the amazing work of medical science in coming little by little to understand. And of course, they still, medical science does not quite understand the disease at all, the COVID-19. But they have been able to understand how better to treat the disease, which makes it less lethal, perhaps, you could say. Although we still have so many reports about uh, effects which uh, people begin to feel even considerable time after supposedly they've recovered. Um, but anyway, my little duet, this is my own response as a musician, as an artist, to what was happening, and in, in general, to why things are the way they are and not a different way. Uh, I called it why. And uh, I called it why in, in English rather than in some more florid language because English does have a kind of directness of word uh, despite what I was saying before. And why is just why. So bear with us, please, as we get through this little duet. And thank you for bearing with me today. And I hope that everyone who's watching, everyone who will watch this, is in, in good health and that all your loved ones are safe as well. Thank you. Okay, shall we?
Thank you.